Edmund, thank you so much. And um, we knew when we were uh, identifying experts in uh, exposure monitoring that you'd be able to give us a very textured perspective. It's something that you've been thinking about for a long time, and now you're really embracing the whole notion of big data and what it means, and thanks also for pointing out the privacy concerns. Um, in the interest of time, to keep us hopefully as close to schedule as we possibly can, it is a pleasure to uh, introduce Baruch Fischoff from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Baruch has been a guru in risk and decision sciences for a very long time, and I can attest to that as to how much impact that he's had in public health. In 1988, I met Baruch as a, a newly minted undergraduate who was convening a conference on the primary prevention of, a of AIDS. We called it AIDS then in 1988. And Baruch was there to give us perspective on health information and health communications. And I'm sure, Baruch, you don't remember me, but I remember you. <laughs> so uh, Baruch will be uh, giving us his perspectives on mobilizing the science of science communication, providing environmental health information that people need, want, and use. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and, and I'm really pleased to be here. It's really a fan, fantastic program. I, my, one of the first academy committees I was on was in the early 1980s in support of N NIEHS and setting priorities in the National Toxicology Program. It's a really fantastic organization, and, and I think we've seen that we have the science here that can help people. It can inform regulatory bodies, and as we just saw in this last presentation, if we can just make it accessible to people, it could be enormously empowering. And so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to be, uh, be talking about. Um, so a as it happens, let's see. Okay, so overview. So I'm going to talk about principles of communication design. I want to look at this as a design problem, not as, not as a scientific problem. How do we take advantage of what we know in order to be useful to people? threats to the design process. I think we can do a whole lot more than we're doing now, and finally ways to mobilize the, uh, the science for, for design. But first, I want to, at this time last year, I was preparing, I was teaching a project class on this topic. And uh, this is something we do, it's a capstone class for our under, undergraduates. Uh, we were looking at two environmental monitors through a chance meeting at a, at, with in, at a meeting on nuclear power in India. I met Joe Morrow, sort of a fascinating American expatriate in Japan, who after Fukushima had found you couldn't get a Geiger counter, so he figured out how to put them together for, through pieces. You know, like, you know, you go to the shop, it's, you have to do some soldering, so it's not quite as easy as uh, some of the, well, you probably did some soldering. And, uh, and then I got back home and I discovered that, that we had an equally fascinating group at Carnegie Mellon that was doing, dealing the spec, spec sensor, which, and then, um, which Gabrielle is going to be talking about later. They're sort of interesting conscious and not just different, uh, different environmental threats, but one is deliberately kind of geeky, the spec sensor, and the other is meant to be very, uh, very accessible. So it's one of the things we do for our, uh, oh, for our students. Uh, we have an advisory panel, including uh, Gabri uh, Gabrielle. And I'll talk at the very end about what some of the, what the students, uh, students found, but I think will, which I think will be kind of consistent with what some of your, this fantastic Imperial Valley thing. So these are principles of communication design. I use the term science communication here. It's become kind of a term of art to, for situations in which you're not trying to make the science interesting, but you're trying to make it useful. So the one you might think of as science education, and science communication in some circles means what do we know? Typically science education is about one science, and typically science communication can't be about one science because you need contributions from the dose and the response people and the regulatory people and all the, the context that people need. So the process of uh, science communication is pretty, is, this is, a kind of straightforward task analysis. You do some, you do some form of analysis in order to identify the science that's relevant to the choices that people have, have to make. So, out of the fire hose of information that we could give people, what few things really matter and are actionable, are, are actionable, and 
looks sufficiently small that people, if the set is sufficiently small, that you've got people's confidence that you've thought about their interest and not just about your, your science. Typically a small window of opportunity, if you blow it by dumping irrelevant, incomprehensible information on people, then you've lost your audience and you haven't fulfilled your duty to inform, even if the right stuff is someplace in there. You do descriptive research to find out what people know all, all, already, what they belong, what are their what are their issues. You do some kind of interventions to see whether you can actually help them, and then you see how well you've done, and then you iterate because you can't conceivably get it right the first time. Um, so we've done this process with in, on a variety of different things and projects that have included Anne and Gabrielle and various people. General methodology could work on just about everything if you take the effort to, uh, to apply it. So I thought I would talk about three uh, examples and cases in which there were uh, uh, well endowed, financially well endowed, scientifically very sound, um, very well-meaning interventions that weren't working. So the first uh, is, this is badly designed. I keep pushing the wrong button. So, uh, yeah. That was part of bad design process. So it's like, anyways. Unless you had a much bigger hand than I would, in which case this would work. So first is climate change. So this was the, this was the proposed uh, welcome page for the Surging Seas website put together by, by, climate, uh, by climate Central. This is a typical result of an unmanaged, of a design process with no behavioral science input. <laughs> Terrific science in, in it. And, Everybody who provided the science wanted to have a footprint on the welcome page, which ends up being not particularly welcoming. It got so squeezed that you can see right up in the top in the middle, they wanted to, they wanted to give people the option of saying, what's the sea level rise that they're interested in? And they managed to orient, they tilted the o o ocean at 90 degrees in order to, uh, to squeeze it in. So what was unusual about, about this one was that the COO of, of, uh, of uh, Climate Central, which is a fantastic organization, uh, went to graduate school with our son Ilya, so this is Ben Strauss, and he knew that I worked on this, and he gave me a call and said, well, maybe we can work on this, this together. And so this is work that Gabrielle, Gabrielle did. We went through this. A, there's, a, there's pa papers with, I think, with free download for everything that's cited, uh, cited here. Here's a much cleaner welcome, uh, welcome screen. Get, gave people the things that they wanted to do. Did some testing so that it wouldn't be, wouldn't be biased in, in, in towards people's attitudes towards, towards climate change. You could still get what you wanted, but you, um, uh, but, uh, but, it, but, you weren't, but you weren't overwhelmed. In some subsequent research that Gabrielle, mostly Gabrielle with a little support from me, did, we used the search, we provided as an opening to the Surgency website, Zillow's website, in order to see whether people who were concerned about moving to a house, whether they could they use that information. And we found that, so this is a very complicated website, but builds in an area where people know a, know a lot and has been, has, because it's a commercial firm, it's been heavily tested and has a market test of whether or not people use it or not, so a very powerful kind of, uh, kind of feedback, we find if you believe our results that, that, that people's responses to the, the climate, deci the, these decisions were unrelated, their hypothetical housing decisions were unrelated to their, position, their political positions on climate change. So if you got them to do something practical, the politics seemed to, seemed to, uh, seemed to fade away. So second, second uh, example, vaccination. Everybody here knows about the problems with vaccination. About 10 years ago, we were asked by the, some of the vaccine people at CDC to try to figure out why, or why was the pushback. We looked particularly at, at, at MMR. It's work I did with Julie Downs and Wendy Brun, De Brun, who did most of it. This was the form of analysis here. We tried to identify all of the factors that actually or hypothetically were related to the outcomes that people were concerned about, did semi-structured interviews with, with uh, first-time moms in Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Eugene, where we thought we'd get three different uh, sort of population groups. And what we found was that people were pr surprisingly well-informed. They knew, the people who were skeptics about vaccine knew the arguments that were promoted, that, that were offered by the, by the vaccine, uh, uh, the people responsible for, 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 for vac vaccination, but often found that their concerns were not addressed in those publications. So, 
here's a, this is a coding of publications into that same influence diagram. So here's the official publication, which basically says it's good for you, take it. And he didn't like say it's also good for people who are immuno, immune compromised and can't vaccinate themselves. Didn't say anything about the quality of the post-licensing surveillance that, that gives confidence about the this, this side, side effect rate. So CDC had a story. They chose not to, not, not to tell it. The countervailing story was told by the skeptics. This is from a British group called uh, Jabs. And so not only they addressed things that, that were relevant, that people had is issues with, but they also told a nice story. So, you know, remember Psychology 101, if you trunk information together, people remember it more. So there's some constraints about to uh, government agencies telling arresting, arresting stories, but we could have done a whole lot, whole lot better, but we chose not to test it. Uh, a third... So uh, pharmaceuticals. So you've all seen the equivalent of, you may have one of these in your pocket. Uh, fantastic information available to everybody and, of course, useless. It, it's actually not only useless because of the dense, density, but if there were a physician, a physician could not find the quantitative estimates of risks and benefit and associated uncertainties that would be needed to make, to make, make a decision. So you can do a lot better than that. Uh, Lisa Schwartz and Steve Woloshin at the VA and, and the Dartmouth Medical School have been working for years developing and testing using the kind of science that uh, sort of decision science, behavioral science. They developed this drug fact box. Turns out representative samples of, of American public can extract the information that they need in order to make, make decisions. There are people who would believe, oh, this is way too quantitative, way too complicated. No, it's got a, it's got a transparent structure. If you're interested in it, it's got a transparent structure. It shows the competing diseases, separates risks and, be risks and benefits, uh, gives you some idea where the, where the information came from so you could kind of figure out how, figure out how, how good it is. You could do this. Uh, it's, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work, but it's not the people are innumerate. It's because people, we give them information that, that it makes it in, in ways that it makes it impossible for them to understand. Uh, they tried, for, there was a time in the middle of the last decade in which FDA was thinking seriously of doing this, even had like a coding guide to, to go from their reviewer reports into, into, it just turned out to be too big a lift, changing a label, big lift. So they've gone, they're doing this on, on, on themselves. Something that FDA has been doing, it, and which was within it, and partly part of its uh, negotiation with the pharmaceutical industry, is that FDA has produced a, a, uh, a standard approach to benefit risk assessment. The prob problem that FDA was facing was an inability to communicate or difficulty in communicating with the pharmaceutical industry in a, in, in a transparent way so they would know, is it worth putting a billion dollars into this drug? You know, we have some idea what the risks and benefits might look like. Will you, will you approve it if we don't have a profile like that? They also had some internal um, uh, 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 communication issues that so you might have a drug like somebody mentioned C diff I think yeah and you could say well somebody wants that wants to is interested in getting in uh, uh, getting approval for a drug that deals with initial infections you know that they're going to come back for reinfections it's the responsible thing to, it's the commercial and the responsible thing to do. We'll reassemble a team. We'll be, we'll be able to reassemble our thinking to see how to, how to kind of do systematic updating of the old evidence in the light of the, of the, of the, uh, the new evidence. So oh, I, got, I got pulled into this, and, and FDA ended up coming up with this format, which is not all that different than the drug facts box format, as the way that as of this year, it's beginning to, re to summarize its, 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 its reports. And it has in the columns, the rows are five things that are important to FDA. It's important for industry to know what it's, what, what it, and the public to know what it's considering. And it makes a distinction between the column on the left, which is evidence and uncertainties, we have a duty to tell people how good the evidence is, and what they call conclusions and, uh, and, and reasons, which is what is the regulatory interpretation? You know, what do we think this means in terms of our enabling le le legis legislation? Um, 
This went through multiple testing with F FDA's own internal staff so that they felt that they could be faithfully trans translate the evidence that they were looking at into, into this uh, synoptic term. So you still get the full report, all the details, but this gives you a summary of, of, of what it is, and it's, that's already in a format where somebody could say, oh yeah, I can do it. If that's what FDA thinks is really important, that's the evidence I'm gonna put in, the, in my drug fact box, as opposed to having to say this is what I think is, uh, is, it, uh, uh, is, is important. So these are some of the, th these are the properties of that, uh, that thing. So, so it is a form of technical communication to an, uh, to an internal audience, each of, each of whose members has great expertise in some subset of the problem, but not expertise in the problem a a a as a whole, in a sense, faces the same problems of members of the public who aren't expert in anything. Uh, so, but if you're an expert in pharmacokinetics, you might not be an expert in the, in uh, in drug registries if you thought that that was part of the part of part of the plan. And FDA has gone on to uh, it have has a systematic listening campaign. Every four every three months, they they convene a group, mostly here for, they mostly here from patients. There's, you can find these online. There's, very moving one on sickle cell disease from a few years uh, years ago. In order to build up, it's you know to systematically listen to to consumer communities to find out what their issues are. So it builds up its own internal ex ex uh, expertise. So and we have lots of resources for doing this this kind of uh, kind of design. This is this is kind of old science in many in many ways. Uh, the academy had a committee the year after the one that, that Melissa mentioned uh, uh, called Improving Risk Risk Communicate uh, Risk Communications. Still pretty readable. Uh, we've had the I've had the opportunity to help to co-organize. Um, together with actually with the so sort of the instigation of the late uh, Ralph uh, Ralph Cicerone two two Sackler colloquia on the science of science communication with associated special issues the proceedings of the National Academy of Science is a third in the works for almost this actually for exactly this time uh, time next year here's the uh, Pictures. I have two papers. Put in a small plug for they're free, <laughs> so uh, you don't have to buy them. And uh, so, 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 and so you can find the one on the sciences of science communication and one on communicating scientific uh, uncertainty. There was an academy committee that I was on for FDA, which is trying to figure out how to communicate uncertainty, which was still an open topic. It pretty. It's a pretty good report. Uh, there was another committee on gain of function research uh, for pathogens of pandemic potential. These are a gain of function for Ebola would be becoming more readily transmissible uh, from looking for the virus's perspective. <laughs> and to the, the community of people concerned with that are divided between people who say you absolutely need to know about that and people say, oh, no, don't go there. So uh, Harvey Fein, uh, Feynman uh, uh, chaired the Sure, that, that, that committee. Uh, FDA has a risk communication advisory committee that I, I had the honor of chairing for its first four years, and we have this online guide. It has about 20 chapters. They're all 3,000 words, words long, and uh, meant to, met in each of the chapters say, here's what the problem is, say communicating quantitative information. Here's what the literature says. And uh, here's kind of a, our best guess at how to design communications. And then here's how do you evaluate those communications? Because our best guess is, the best guess of somebody who knows the science is going to be better than the best guess of somebody who doesn't know the science, but it's still a guess. So I think there's two barriers. So this science is very rarely applied. So uh, why is that? Um, so I think there's, so I thought of and thinking about this. I thought here's what, I keep trying to find different ways of saying this. So it's sort of the same story, slightly different, but packaged a little differently. So I'll keep my I'll keep my colleagues awake. Awake. So, so I think two problems. We have a surfeit of theories and a paucity of evaluation. Um, so a surfeit of theories. So it turns out there is an awful lot of social behavioral science that is relevant to, to communication. So for those of us like myself who are trained as cognitive psychologists, we've got a lot of cognitive theories that you would like to know 
uh, know about and might come in handy for one communication or, or another. And none of them provides a magic bullet for, for, for doing a communication. Each is you know, probably robust, might explain some percentage of the variance in, in, people's, in people's behavior. So for example, people, we found that people are very good at tracking what they see, but not at detecting sample, sample biases. That's kind of settled science. The people who work in that area disagree about how it is that, pe how it is that we automatically keep track of, track of things, but we know that, that to be, to, you know, people would more or less ag agree on, on, on that. And if you thought, that you were dealing with people who needed to reconcile, say, the measures you were giving them in their, in their everyday ob observations, you would want to know that science, otherwise it's not going to make sense to them, and you're not going to be able to anticipate what that discrepancy uh, is, so you might not even address the, the issue. Uh, we have many theories of choice. So people consider the return on their investment when making decisions. So they see an unwelcoming welcome screen. They see jargon that they don't that they don't understand. They think this is more about your research than about their than their health. Well, then they'll they'll, they'll change channels. So we know something. There are people who study that know something about what makes communications look as though they're worth. The t worth your, worth your your time, and you'd certainly want somebody with that knowledge on your on your team. So we have a surfeit of theories. The set of theories is large. The contextual triggers are 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 subtle, and, and the interactions between these theories are complicated. As a result. Uh, Communication requires broad knowledge of all of these different principles, and these are just the cognitive principles. Uh, and you know, from an individual psychologist, this isn't culture, this isn't affect, this isn't, uh, and uh, so on. It requires broad knowledge and case-specific research. If something hasn't been tested and worked over by as a research project, then uh, then. You're not doing justice either to the work or to the people who, or to the recipients. So, and finally, the next is, uh, so, so there would be a natural corrective if people evaluated their, their communications. So you have efforts like we you know, just heard of in Imperial Valley where, the, commu where the, commu the, the public is at the table and they can tell you if they don't understand and you have a chance to, uh, have have a chance to correct to correct it, but often communications are are the broadband communication. Somebody is sitting in an office comes up with an idea, writes a contract to somebody who give it good production values, and it goes out the door. That you know you sit in your doctor's office and you know wonder where this stuff comes from. Um, so so as I mentioned, this uh, FDA guide we made. There's a chapter on on the importance of evaluation. Uh, every, each of the other chapters ends with guidance on how to evaluate communications for no money at all, so no excuse not to do it, uh, for a little bit of money, or for money commensurate with the personal, organizational, and political stakes resting on effective, effective communication. So I don't think this has made any difference either, but, but we keep trying to, you know, to get the science applied to the uh, practice. Ugh. So why don't people evaluate things? So you can think of cognitive and evalu you know, as we divide the word cognitive and motivational, cognitive and affective reason. A cognitive explanation is, is that everybody has faulty intuitions about how well they understand other people and vice versa. So if you think you can read their minds and you think they, think you think they can read yours. As a result, they may design poor programs, messages, whatever, and then blame their public because it was perfectly clear to me. Why wasn't it perfectly clear to you? Uh, and why are these cognitive? This is the stock and trade of, of social psychology. Uh, I mean, they're basically all corollaries on that, on that principle. So the common knowledge effect is we exaggerate how much others share our knowledge. As a result, we fail to provide them with crucial information because it's obvious to us. Uh, the false consensus effect, we exaggerate how much others share our values. As a result, I assume that they will make the same decisions if they hear the same, same evidence. Uh, the fundamental attribution error, we attribute others' behavior to their personality by attributing our own behavior to circumstances. As a result, we assume that we cannot reason with them because they're impenetrable. That's who they, they didn't understand this, they can't understand anything. That's who they are. 
Now us, if you tell me again, oh yeah, I can, yeah, okay. Uh, there are also affective uh, sources of faulty intuition. So scientists have emotions like everybody else, and they can despair of reaching a seemingly irrational uh, public. I once I once had the opportunity early in my career meeting Stephen Cotgrove, who's a British sociologist, one of the first people to work in in this area, who said the hardest thing for him was to convince engineers that they had emotions. <laughs> and so. After Fukushima, I got a call from some friends at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists who said, write something. And I said, I already had written something. That was the, the, the second the URL there, the nuclear industry's communication problem. I'd written it a couple of years early. I said, they had terrible communications in Japan. The American nuclear industry knew that something, had to know that something was going to go wrong somewhere. And they had nothing prepared, and they didn't respond. Just reprint it. So they wouldn't reprint it. They wanted something new. So I figured I had nothing to lose. So I wrote a, paper, a thing on the emotions of the nu nuclear uh, e experts. And I said, here's what our science shows about what you must be going through now. And so we have these emotions, anger, dread, panic, and stress. This is the future of your, your, your industry. And the research, the people, not my research, but the people who do research, so knows that anger makes you confident in your own rectitude and makes you blame other people for problems. They're not situational issues. They cause the problem. Dread leads you to feelings of, of, the, of, being, of risk and threat and a lack of control over your situation. Panic leads to social mobilization, so the industry rabble, ra rallies around uh, against the irrational public, but it can also paralyze individuals because they don't know what, to, know what to do. It leads to stress, which leads to regression to previously new, learned uh, um, behavior and a narrowing of your focus. So I got it off my chest. So. <laughs> Okay, and I think also, I, I think, you know, I, you know I, all these things apply to present company, you know, present company, so I think emotions about these things that you care about so much, they also tend to induce a hero instinct, that you want to be the person with the magic formulation that delivers the public, when well, what is needed is detailed design and testing, so you often find uh, Gabriel knows what I'm thinking about right, right now. You often find very motivated, passionate people who, the people who can mobilize resources are also the people who are not will, willing to listen to evidence. Um, so how would you mobilize the science? So it's, it's there. How, how would you make it more, uh, more, more useful? So I think it needs three things. You need proper staffing, proper process, and then a proper uh, organizational uh, uh, structure. So staffing, I think you need to do communication, you write, you need these four skill, uh, skill sets, and often so at least four different individuals, and typically you may need more than one from each of these domains. You need domain specialists, people who really under the, understand the, the science. I would say in the topic of this meeting, you need people who know the sensors, people who can do the toxicology, people who know the health effects, you know, people who, and, and so, and, and if you, some of them are missing, it's only going to be part of the, going to be part of the story. You need what might be called decision analysts, people who can do the work needed to shrink the enormous volume of, of potential messages to the few things that the audience really needs to know and characterize the quality of the evidence in a responsible way so that people don't come back to you and say, you promised, and they say, oh, no, that was just our best guess. So you need people who can do that kind of risk analytical, decision analytical work. You need behavioral sciences who can listen to the public in a systematic way, help you to un few, those who are not behavioral scientists to uh, to interpret the, wh what it is that people are saying, what it is that they that that they want, and all of us are are, are narrow as well. Psychologists are not particularly good on culture, so you need some sociologists and and and, and so on. And then you need the application professionals, the people who are capable of getting the message out, uh, establishing the kind of community uh, structure that you, that you ha have, have there. And you know, sometimes some of us are good at talking to people and organizing meetings, but, but that's really a whole different skill set. And then, and then I think for, for a healthy functioning working group, everybody should have a say on everything. 
because sometimes the engineer will think of a formulation that the social scientist uh, won't, and sometimes the professional would say, you know, I've been talking to the community, and they're really concerned about this equity issue. Uh, nobody's talked about this. So, uh, and, and, but in the end, you want somebody with final authority, the people who know, have the particular kind of expertise to have the final authority. So somebody who's your liaison with the community can say, you know, you say it that way, it's going to blow up. Trust me. In it, just like you don't want the engineers adding, you know, the technical people adding some some details that are precious to them, but then make make it uh, in, in, incompre incomprehensible. Second, you need a, a, a process. Uh, so there there are, are multiple pictures. I, th I thought the one that you had was really nice. That's kind of consistent with with the better idea. This is from the the general idea of of. You go through a, a problem cycle, uh, cycle, this is about 20 years ago, the Presidential Congressional Commission on Risk Assessment and uh, Risk Management with the public, in the, public in, in the center with the possibility that this might be an iterative process. The, uh, we, I had the opportunity about late 1990s to, sh to serve in an IOM committee on environmental justice. It had a kind of a uh, text version of the same thing, and it said three principles for public health research to address environmental justice issues, improve the science base, involve the affected uh, populations, and communicate the findings to all, all, uh, all, all stakeholders, and then the report goes on to, to talk about how to do it. The formulation that I like best is the, the depict, uh, formulation that I like best is from this obscure Canadian Standards Association uh, uh, document, uh, 19 CSA 850 Q850 1997 reauthorized in 2002. So here's a, a prettier version of the picture, which I think is quite consistent with the imperial value. So you've got some sort of a systematic process. You try to figure out what the problem is. You get more and more explicit about what the issue is. You, you make your trade-offs. You implement something. And you once it's going, you see how well, it, well it's going. It has two uh, uh, one nice feature. I think it's more Canadian than American might be. I think the positive stereotype, which is that there's a reality check between the stages. So maybe it's not working, and you may then need to go back, and you, and maybe the process has failed. So, and and then secondly, there's risk communication all the way, two-way risk communication all the way along. So don't start the process without telling people that you're you're potentially messing with their lives, and don't try to mess with their lives without listening to them to find out what their priorities and predispositions positions are. This. The, the challenges of, do, the, of organizing this process vary a lot. You're sitting someplace, you sit in your workshop, and you're tinkering with some device. Well, where, where's the public? So that's your problem to figure out if you want this to, uh, you know, the, this to work out. If you're out in a community of a modest size, in some place it's relatively easy, but still, I'm sure you tell us, quite an arduous process to get, get, that, uh, get, that, that, to, uh, get that to happen. And then finally, you need an organizational structure w that will, will support that. So this requires a lot of people. It requires a lot of coordination. Everybody's busy. Everybody's drawing a paycheck to do, to do something. And the uh, universities, we're paid to publish. We're expected to publish papers and, and bring in grants. All of this sitting in meetings with other people is extraneous to, uh, you know, to, to our work. Whoever, wherever you get your funding from, they're not paying you. They're paying you to do what their program uh, wants, not necessarily what what the uh, what what the problem needs. So, one way to think about if one is faithful to the problem, and and in a way faithful to the long term interests of the of the enterprise, because if you don't we don't demonstrate our usefulness and don't build up support in the public, then at some point it has a chance of going away. Or if we do, a, you know, even worse, not just don't help people, but do this in a, in a way that's perceived as, uh, as injurious or illegitimate or, mani or, 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 or manipulative, it, it can blow up on us and blows up on somebody, blows up on all of us. There is a kind of pool of, uh, of public goodwill that we all, uh, a commons of public goodwill that we all draw on. So here we could say we need, internally, we need absorptive capacity. That is, 
the organizations that do this need to be able to take it, take advantage of the behavioral evidence, just like the technical evidence and the and the medical evidence, and it needs a strategic commitment that that the communication part will have a seat at the table all the way uh, through it, and then externally you need broad access to the to the latest science. You really want people who are sort of still publishing in the peer reviewed behavioral literature, just like you want people who are still publishing in the peer-reviewed medical and engi engineering literature so that you know you're getting the best of, what's, of, of, uh, of what, what's out there. And you need some resources for the dedicated studies because everything needs to be, needs to be t it's a design process. Design, good designs don't come out of thin air. So let me show a few, in, in, a few uh, examples of, of ways that you might approach it. So, FDA has a strategic plan for risk communication. It was approved in fall 2009. It was started in the Bush administration. It was carried through in the Obama ad ad administ administration. You can find this document online. It's not, not a bad document for other organizations to, uh, to think about. Uh, it has a risk communication, statutory risk communication, um, uh, ad 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 advisory committee that's done. It's a place where staff can come and say, we've got this problem. You know us, you know our regulatory constraints. Could you work the question of, say, emerging of, when I was chairing, we had a, a session on, um, on what they called emerging events. Like, you know something's going wrong with, uh, you know, hip replacements or a pharmaceutical or, or, or it looks like there's a food contamination. You know, if you go to move too soon, then you scare people needlessly, lose your credibility, have 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 coughs. You go too late, then people have been hurt, industries have been injured, and it looks like a cover up. So we came up with some general guidance on that, but they had a body where they 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 could uh, they have a body where they can uh, they they can go. Other possibilities, so that's building internal capacity. You could build external capacity. This is what I think we do in my Department of Engineering and Public Policy. We have a couple of alums, uh, uh, alums here. People come to us if we can find the way to keep the doors, keep the bills paid, you know, bills paid, then we're there for people to, uh, people to come. Another model, which is, which is, because I mean, a lot of what, what, what I think we do through in, in, in EPP is actually subsidized by the university. That is, we have, we ha unlike people in medical schools, we have nine month, uh, nine month salaries. So part of we, it's our choice to spend some of our time um, trying to be trying to be useful. For many years, the Medical Research Council in Britain had a, uh, had, a had an applied psychology unit, which I got to spend a year at in the early early 19, 1980s. And so it was led by senior scientists. Are there any psychologists here? These were the top British psychologists. They worked on the top problems. Its roots were, among other things, in, in designing the Cambridge cockpit, which helped Britain get through the war, the Battle of Britain, by getting getting flyers, pilots in, into the air with fewer training, with fewer training, uh, training a accidents. If you. If, because I don't have a picture of it here. It was remarkably primitive and remarkably, um, uh, remarkably uh, effective, and it has aligned assignments that, roughly speaking, members of staff were expected to uh, to to demonstrate their ability to publish in, in peer-reviewed journals and to get, in effect, to demonstrate their social usefulness so that there were people in the British government who would say, yes, I'm glad I had the opportunity to talk to members of the uh, APU about designing coins or telexes or traffic, uh, uh, so on. So it was like, you know, 275 percent jobs, but it did require you to have but most of them. We have really nothing like that. Very, next to nothing like that in this country. We have had, we had the American Soldier Project during World War, World War II, so occasionally we've had mobilizations to, to but, but it's, been, but it's been, uh, been rare, and I think without these kind of institutional structures, it's hard to get this sustained, uh, this sustained effort. So Alan Badley, who was head at that, is a famous British cognitive neuroscientist, made this really interesting distinction. He said it's not basic and applied research, but, but, but you have these two bridging dispensions which are, which are essential to getting the society to support 
the science and to get this and to keep the science fresh. One is I get this right, applied basic science, you take what you hold to be true and you see whether it works in the real world, and the other is, is a basic applied science where you find new phenomena and then domesticate it for the regular scientific audience through the applications. So I thought I would end with uh, a couple of slides from my class. So they were trying to figure out how to make the spec sensor, uh, sensor useful, and with a little help from their faculty, they realized that you that the observation period made a difference. So this is a, a PM 2.5 sensor. I forgot I, I forgot to add, add, add that. So you get the you know sense of the instantane almost instantaneous, very noisy, and or you could do smoothing. So probably the one on the left is too noisy, and probably the one on the right is too smooth. So it was part of our educational process, but it, unless you wanted to know whether you wanted to live with a smoker, in which case, <laughs> you know, uh, actually maybe the first blip, you know, the first <laughs> second would be would be all that you uh, all that you needed. But so here's a f this is an aspect of, of of something that would be familiar, an issue that would be familiar to any scientist. Our students had the background to be able to understand it, but it wasn't immediately obvious to them because they started with the jittery one on the left and, uh, and we had to ask them, ask them questions. So you think, okay, so we're giving this information to people, very much like the question that, that you asked, will they know to ask the question and will they be able to, able to, to in, in, interpret? This is a case where anybody who can ask the question can probably uh, interpret it. And then we had, then they had, had two observations in, a, in a, one of the student apartment with and without a pet, and it just turned out to be hopelessly confounded. So there was lower, various other things that went wrong in students' lifestyle. lifestyle. But, but finally, the thing that they found was most interesting and troubling is that citizens who had this didn't know who to call when they had a problem. And they said, we designed, the, this is what the, they, they talked to people in the, in the community, they said this is where, this is who's talking to who. They said people are very frustrated, they're very angry, they're making the people whom they call angry because they don't have authority to do anything operating on data that don't have the kind of uh, a calibration that you, were, that you were talking about. And the students came up with an ideal model of how the world would be designed to respond to citizens who properly understood what they were getting from personal environmental uh, monitors. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Baruch, uh, for being a steady source of logic and reasoning and insight uh, for scientists and also all of us that are very committed in informing and conveying our science back to the public in useful ways. Uh, so thanks for that enlightenment, especially at a time where um, hyper-rationalization uh, and logic may not always be the, the realm of the day. Um, it is my unenviable task to keep us all on time, and so lunch is now on our schedule. I'm going to ask our speakers of the morning to please make yourselves available in the cafeteria so that folks that have questions can talk to you more and engage you more. I wish we could do it in the open forum, but time doesn't permit. So lunch is available um, via purchase on the third floor. And I also need to ask all of the speakers and committee members today if they could see Annika Sen uh, before going to lunch. So we will reconvene back at 1230 here. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs>